Hello and welcome to yet another very exciting Kuba HQ tutorial. I'm Kuba Michalski and today we're going to tackle Hollywood Operating System, or HOLAS for short, one more time. Last time we dealt with probably most popular Hollywood effect, which is image enhancement, in the tutorial published on etudesplus.com. We started with a low quality image and through the magic of computer graphics we managed to enhance it and reveal the number on top of the car. Today we're going to deal with the second most popular effect in Hollywood movies and that's password hacking. Now the accepted standard for password hacking in Hollywood movies isn't really exciting. It typically looks something like this. We have some digits and letters flickering on the screen then the password gets revealed character by character, sometimes turns into asterisks, etc. Now, if I did a tutorial based on this technique, this would probably end up the Kuba HQ tutorials as nobody would ever come back to see what's next. That's why I decided to do something a bit more exciting and create my own way of hacking passwords Hollywood style. And this is what it looks like. I think it's much more exciting we have nice depth with a grid created in three dimensions, characters popping in and out like some sort of crazy 3D crossword puzzle. Everything's glowing, keeping the audience captivated. Let's do it. We're going to start with a simple square composition, 800 by 800 pixels. And we can call it module 01. We're going to have a number of them. Just to be on the safe side, let's make the composition fairly long, perhaps even one minute. The leftover from the previous demo I was doing left me at 10 frames a second. I'm going to switch it to 25 and I think we're good to go. We're going to start by creating our grid. So for that, I will need a new black solid composition size. Place it in our module one and apply generate grid effect to it. Now, as you can see by default, the grid doesn't look very great. I mean, the lines are very thick and it creates those nasty outlines all around my composition. So first thing I'm going to do is move the anchor point to minus 20 by minus 20 and move the corner into 40 by 40. And that results in a grid in which each cell is 60 by 60 pixels and I have 12 cells horizontally and vertically with some extra spikes sticking outside of the main body of the grid. I can also change the border thickness to let's say one and a half and that should be thin enough to look good but thick enough for you to be able to see it on the video. Now I also want to accentuate those intersections a little bit better and for that I'm going to duplicate my grid layer, switch on the invert grid toggle, increase the border a little bit and I can see that it's a bit too sharp so I can set the feather to let's say 5 by 5 pixels and then keep on increasing border until we're left with just little dots sitting in the center of each of the squares and then we'll need to offset them to sit on the intersections. And I can't remember the exact numbers that we need to use. So I'm just going to drag the corner point to the center of one of the squares and the anchor point to the center of another one. And maybe just to see it a little bit better, I can right now decrease the border so our dots become a bit bigger and then make sure that both the anchor point and corner are nice round numbers that can be divided by 10. So this would be uh, 130 and so will be this one. And now they sit exactly where they're supposed to and we can increase the border back to the size we wanted. Now at this point, you may want to stop for a moment and look at what you have created because unintentionally, we made a very nice optical illusion here on the screen. If you look at just one of the center points that you created, it will be perfectly white, but all the ones surrounding it will appear to be filled with black color. And as you move the eyes around the composition, that interference pattern is moving together with your sight. Now, this is completely unintentional, but I thought it it's worth noting since it's a fun little optical illusion. So once you sufficiently confused your eyes and your brain, we can go into animating this effect. What I want to happen is I want the points to appear first 
then introduce the vertical lines and then horizontal lines and I cannot do it with a single grid that features both the horizontal and vertical ones so we're going to need to separate it into two different layers and I think this would be a good time to rename our layers so that we don't get lost so this one will be called dots and the other one will be grid H for horizontal and to turn this grid into horizontal lines, I just need to go to the corner property and increase the X value until there are no vertical lines remaining. In other words, I need to move the corner point outside of the screen on the right side. And let's turn it off for a moment right now and concentrate on our dots. All the elements in this composition are going to be matted with a feathered soft circle. So let's create that right now. I'm going to make yet another solid, maybe rename it into mat. And right there in generate category, I'm going to apply the effect called circle. And from the get go, I'm going to switch its mode and you cannot see it because the menu extends the recording area. I'm going to switch the mode into stencil alpha. And what that does is creates a mat, exactly the shape of our layer. And as we modify it, we can control what's visible and what's not. If I toggle the transparency grid, well, we can't see much because our dots are white. Yeah, if we zoom in, we can see that everything is transparent except for our dots. All right, let's set it up. I would go back to our black background, increase the feather to, let's say, 100, and then keep increasing the radius until we reach the state where the dots are barely visible around the edges. And if I switch on my grid right now, you'll see that it's as well affected by that mat. So this is a pretty good technique if you don't want to create a separate mat for each element in your composition. Let's switch this grid off once again for a moment and just animate our mat. So we're going to start at zero seconds, bring the radius to zero, create a keyframe, go forward 20 frames. You can zoom in a little bit and maybe even reveal those keyframes and then increase the radius to our desired size. And I think around 330 is quite good for us. I can also hit F9 to ease this one and collapse it back. So if we right now preview it, we have a nice little intro to this particular composition. Next, we'll want to animate our grid reveal. So let's turn it on finally. Navigate to transitions and choose linear wipe. Now, if I animate the transition completion, you'll see that we are hiding or revealing the lines depending on the direction we go. Now, I don't want them to go all at the same time. Let's try to get a little bit more space in here. So first of all, I'm going to turn it around and then adjust the angle to, let's say, 135 degrees. That should do it nicely. Maybe increase the feather a little bit so the transition isn't quite so harsh. Go all the way to 100 to make the layer disappear. Go 10 frames ahead, so we're starting at the time code of 10. Keyframe transition completion. Go 20 frames ahead, bring it down to zero and this should work for us. Yeah, so the lines start animating while the dots are still revealing. This way we don't fall into this animation where every element waits for the previous one to stop. And we can now also add the vertical lines. And this is going to be fairly simple. We'll just duplicate the grid H layer, rename it into grid V for vertical and rotate it minus 90 degrees. Maybe also we can offset it, uh, let's say 10 frames. This is all looking good, maybe except for the angle. I would like the left ones to reveal first. So let's quickly adjust this. Uh, I can just type minus 45 in here and now we're done. One last adjustment that we could apply in here would be to set the transparency of all the layers to let's say 75 percent and switch their mode to additive so it's add in the menu let's give it a last preview all the reveal is looking nice 
horizontal ones come in, vertical ones come in. Fine. So we're done with setting up the grid and now we need to prepare all the letters of the alphabet and the crossword effect. First of all, let's clean up a little bit. I'm going to select all the layers that create the grid and shy them away. And also I'm going to switch off the mat for now because we really want to see the size of the grid. And maybe we can also go forward to, let's say, three seconds where everything is revealed and we don't have any animation happening. It would be quite typical for Hollywood to use some hip, techy looking characters, but interfaces are all about legibility. So I'm going to go with Georgia. It's a very nice clean typeface that will look great for this composition. Let's make sure that our paragraph is set to center. Click inside of the first box and we start typing. So we type A, enter B, enter C, enter D, E, F, G, H, I, J. And we need 12 of them. So let's see how many we have. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, K and L. All right, now they don't quite well fit in our place yet, so I'm going to move the A right to the center of the first square and increase our vertical spacing to 60, which is the size of our boxes. At this point, you may wonder, why am I typing those letters vertically, not horizontally? And the reason is, as they appear, I don't want the viewer to realize that each letter actually sits always in the same place. If we would type it horizontally, it would be quite easy to spot, but the vertical positioning is much harder for the eye to recognize, and it will look much more random as the final effect. So now that the first column is done and ready, we just need to keep on duplicating it, changing the characters and filling the screen up. So let's make a copy, move it to approximately the center of the next box, double click, and I believe we finished on the letter L. So we'll go M N O P Q R S T U V X Y. And I think that's all the space we have in there. Let's just make sure. Yep. Another copy move it to the side and this time we go starting with Z and then going through the digits so Z 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 0 and the letter A now the only problem that I see right now is that in Georgia some of the numbers are lowercase I guess they do not sit in the center, they are aligned much like the lowercase Q or P would be so we need to fix those and I think the easiest way would be to just use the text animator in here. So with the four selected, I'm going to animate position and that creates a range selector only around four. So I can now bring it up a little bit and do the same thing for seven. Animate position, bring it up and let's see, do we have any other straightways? Well, maybe nine as well so animate position and move it back up well there's five as well okay maybe not such a wise choice of font looks nice but it's a bit of pain in the neck to adjust everything in here all right this should do it and our next column was going to go from b to m the following one from N to Z, and so on and so forth. So why don't I just pause the video right now, fill it up with text, and I'll see you on the other side. Ta-da! Just like in a good cooking show, here's the one we prepared earlier. The grid is right now filled with letters and numbers, and as you see, the whole thing looks fairly random, and it takes a moment to realize that if you read the whole thing vertically, all the letters and numbers are actually in order. Our timeline grew somewhat, we have all these new yellow layers for the text, which we can right now shy away so they don't disturb us. The next step is to create a white rectangle that will randomly jump between the cells of our grid. And to do that, we're going to use an adaptation of a fairly complex expression originally written by Dan Eberts of motionscript.com. 
This site is pretty much an essential reading material for anybody learning After Effects expressions and scripting, as well as for people who simply want to use already existing expressions or do some adaptations to the ones written by professionals. So this is what the expression looks like. And let me just quickly run you through uh, different segments of it and explain what they do. First of all, we have uh, my end time. And right now it's set to 50. I should actually change it to 60. This decides at which point in time the rectangle or the layer that it's applied to will stop moving around. Now our composition is one minute long, so we want it to move around throughout the entire length of it. That's why I'm setting it to 60. Have I set it to, let's say, 10 seconds, our layer would jump around for 10 seconds and then settle on its final position. Next, we have a minimum and maximum segment duration, and these two values determine how long will it take for our layer to move to a new position. I want my layer to always stay in one place for 20 frames and then move to a new location. So I set both values to 0.8 seconds and in 25 frames per second timecode, that results in 20 frames. Minimum and maximum value those determine the output of our expression and since our grid is 12 by 12 cells i set it to oscillate between 0.0, .0 and 11.99 if i set it to 12 i would have a very small chance of my box actually jumping to a cell number 13 so i have to set it just below 12 in order to make sure that it stays within the boundaries that i set for it Next, we have all this crazy math happening, and I'm not really going to dive too deep into it, but basically this is where everything happens. And as an output, we'll receive a random number between minimum and maximum value every 0.8 seconds. So once we have this number, and this part of the expression reads it out, we multiply it by 60, which is the width of our cell, and I also added a 40 by 40 pixel offset to it to make it easier for us to position our solids. So that's pretty much it about the expression. Let me now copy it and paste it to a new layer. So let's create a new solid. And this time we want it to be white and 60 by 60 pixels inside. We can call it box 01 expand its position property alt click on a stopwatch to enable expressions and paste what we've just typed in a notepad and if we look at it right now it's still not quite well positioned so what we need to do is to change its anchor point to 0 comma 0 and right now we can see that it sits right in the middle of the cell and if we preview the composition we'll see how it randomly jumps from one spot to another. Now, it still doesn't look very good just jumping randomly like that. So let's add a little bit of fade to it. And for that, we're going to bring the opacity property. Go to the first frame of the layer, set the opacity to zero, keyframe it, go one, two, three frames ahead, set it to 100, go back to the beginning, and then to time code 20 and set it back to zero. Let's zoom in a little bit. We can also ease the middle one just to make it a little bit smoother. And then again, we'll need to apply another expression. So I'll click on the time swatch and go to property. Now this is hard to see right now. Let me rearrange the timeline a little bit. Yes, so we go to property and then use loop out expression. And what this will do is basically repeat the sequence of keyframes until forever. So let's preview this and see if everything is working fine. Yes, it is. So since our randomizer is changing the position every 20 frames and we made sure that on every 20 frames the box disappears completely we don't have this abrupt jump from one place to another and it appears as if we have a number of boxes appearing in different places 
Now the cool thing is that the way After Effects generates random numbers takes under consideration the index of our layer. So this little number in here saying 13 will actually affect the way the random number is generated. So if I duplicate this layer three more times, one, two, three, each of the new ones is going to take a different position. So why don't we offset them in time a little bit by let's say one, two, three, four, five frames. more and solo them for a moment and this generates a quite complex continuous loop of blinking rectangles it no longer seems like either one rectangle moving around or just appearing and disappearing in different places it's pretty much a constant motion and we have just a few more steps to complete this composition so first thing we need to do is of course uh, bring them underneath the mat come here and turn the mat on so they will be affected by our masking and second thing let's unshy the layers get all the text layers in and switch their mode to and again you can't see it because we're exiting the recording area but i'm switching them to silhouette alpha and basically that will punch the hole through all the boxes and work exactly opposite than how our mat is working. So if we preview this right now, we created an illusion in which it seems that every box has a letter or a number on it, while we know exactly what's happening. The letters are sitting separately and the boxes are separate. If we look at it with the transparency on, we're actually punching nice transparent holes through our composition. So we just have one more thing to do in this composition and that is to offset our boxes a little bit more so that the lines draw themselves first and then we start blinking the numbers and letters. And I think one second and 10 frames should be just about enough. So I'm moving all the layers ahead a little bit and that concludes this part of the tutorial. Our module is ready and right now it's time to construct the whole contraption in 3D. Well, After Effects 3D that is. Alright, let's get on it. First of all, I'm going to need to have 13 copies of this composition. So let's create 13 different modules. And just as the index of the layer affects the randomization of our script, so does the name of the composition. So you can see we're at the time code of two seconds in module 01, and we can see 5, 6, and Z on it. If we open module 02 and go to the same time code, we can see a completely different combination. That's going to help us keep everything nicely randomized and unrepetitive. Let's now create one more composition, and that's going to be called Axis01. And it's 800 by 800 pixels at 25 frames a second, one minute long, exactly like all of our modules. And we're just going to take all the modules and dump them inside. Are they centered properly? Yes, they are. Next, we're going to turn them all into 3D layers and use an expression to offset them in z-axis. So to do that, let's unroll the property for position for module one and two and start typing. First of all, I want to create a variable which will read the index number of the layer, subtract one, and that will be used to drive the offset and make it different for each of the layers. So I'll write x equals index minus one, semicolon next line y equals and i'm going to link to the position of module 01 semicolon and finally y plus open parenthesis open square brackets sorry open bracket and then square bracket 0 comma 0 comma 60 close the square bracket times x and close the normal bracket and this basically offsets my module 0, 2 by 60 pixels in Z direction while keeping both X and Y the same as the original. Now, in order to copy paste this expression to the other layers, I need to create one keyframe. This keyframe is not going to really do anything, but basically 
help us carry the data over. So with that keyframe copied, I can right now select all the other layers and paste the data in there. And we can already see that we're starting to get a nice 3D structure in there. And since we're going to be mixing three copies of this composition, each of them extruded along different axes, we need to make sure that our middle layer is in the perfect center of the composition. So let's just get the position property for module 07. I can even change its color to yellow. And we see that right now it's offset by 360. So I'm going to move module 01 to minus 360 effectively zeroing the middle one and placing it in that center of the composition. And finally, now that we're done with all the spatial offsets, let's do the temporal one as well. Uh, I'm going to maximize this panel so we can see it better. Uh, we select all the layers, right click on the first one, go to keyframe assistant sequence layers and type 59 seconds and 24 frames. So basically one frame less than the entire length of the composition with transition set to off. And that's going to make each layer start one frame later than the previous one. And finally, let's adjust the transparency a little bit. Uh, if we look at any of the modules, we'll see that the center is perfectly opaque and it gets more and more transparent as we travel towards the edges. Now, in our axis composition, everything is exactly the same opacity, making the entire composition look a little bit too blocky. So why don't we do that right now? Let's select all the layers, hit T for transparency, and we're going to keep module 07, the central one, at 100. And then as we come towards the edges, we'll gradually lower the opacity until we hit, I think 5% would be the last one. So we have 60, 40, this could be at 20, 10, and the outmost ones would be 5%. So let's have a look at it. Yeah, I think this did the trick. The whole thing looks more like a sphere right now rather than a cube. And perhaps one last tweak that we could do in here would be to change the mode of all the layers into add. So we gain some nice highlights as the whites overlap with each other. And I think that does it for our axis composition. And now it's time to put it all together. So to do that, I'm going to create our final composition. So this would be our password hacking or even Hollas password hacking and I'm going to use a widescreen pal with square pixels the length remains the same 25 frames a second widescreen always looks nicer and let's drag the axis 01 into here and turn it into a 3d layer then duplicate it twice. And if we go a little bit ahead, maybe to 25 seconds, we can right now see how the whole thing looks. Now, we may feel like it's three-dimensional, but as soon as we look from a different direction, we'll see that we're still dealing with a flat layer. No worries, this will turn into 3D in just a moment, but first let's do a little bit of rotation. So for the second layer, I'm going to use the Y rotation and turn it positive 90 degrees and for the third layer I believe that should be X and we'll move it to negative 90. We can also offset them a little bit while we're at it so let's move this one let's say 30 frames ahead and another 30. Right now we're going to use the Collapse Transformations tool. Now we can see After Effects really working hard to render this. Unfortunately, at this stage of the project, it becomes really, really painful to render. Let's Collapse Transformations and magically everything turns into nice sphere that if the computer allows, we should be able to orbit around. Yes, we're actually able to. Fantastic. So everything is in place. We just need a camera, a couple of nulls to animate the whole thing and some nice background. Let's start by creating the camera rig. For now, I can 
hide and shy away the axis layers. We won't be animating them. Let's create a new camera. 28 millimeters preset should be fine. It has a fairly wide angle lens, but not too extreme. And a couple of nulls, so one and two. Let's turn them both into 3D. Call this one uh, animation null. And this would be the center. Parenting animation null to center and camera into animation null. And at this point, I think it's time to switch the view to the active camera. Maybe give us a little bit more space or perhaps we can zoom out. Yes, this should be fine. And we're going to use the center to adjust the original camera pitch and rotation and then animation null to do the actual body of movement. So we're going to control the pitch using X rotation and we need negative 45 for that. And the middle value of orientation is going to let us orbit around to positive 45 right now. So we're looking at it from kind of interesting angle. Actually, I'm thinking maybe we could bring the camera a little bit closer. Now, since it's parented to the null, we can easily animate its position simply by changing the Z value. And I think around minus, whoa, minus 700 should be just fine. And at this point, we can really see the computer starting to struggle with the rendering of each frame. So let's lower the preview resolution to third, collapse the center, collapse the camera and unroll the rotation for animation now. And we can also shorten our composition to the length of 15 seconds. I know we prepared everything for one minute long, but it would just take insane time to render the whole thing. So shorten it to 15 and trim comp to work area okay so let's zoom back in so we can see the frame a little bit fuller and adjust our rotation properties so we'll want to be a bit more towards the left and perhaps a bit higher up in the beginning so i'm setting it to minus 45 let's say 20. let's keyframe all the rotations in the beginning well actually orientation as well go to the end and find some nice angle so it would probably look nice to do a really strong swing in here and also turn it more towards the right uh, it takes a moment to adjust the whole thing but you can do it per taste maybe a bit of a rotation here and this is looking pretty good so this is what our current animation looks like rendered at half resolution i'm pretty happy with it but i think we could add a little bit of wiggle to the center rotation just to give it a little bit more randomness and kind of handheld feel so let's expand the rotation properties apply wiggle expression to orientation and that would read wiggle uh, let's say once a second by five degrees we shouldn't go too far with it and this should render much faster right now but i'm still going to pause and resume once it's done so after running a preview i realized that the values of 1,5 on the wiggle were way too high and created really chaotic animation i lowered it to 0.5,5 and this is the final result i think it's looking pretty good so let's do the background add some shine and render now, there are many ways we could do the background in this composition. We could use a bunch of layers positioned far away from the camera, some gradients, etc. But I'm just gonna take the easy way out and use Trapcode Horizon, another plugin from Trapcode, the makers of Particular, 3D Stroke, Shine, and many other fantastic plugins. And that will allow me to very quickly create a makeshift background that's synchronized with the camera and very easy to use. So once again, let's hide some layers. We can hide everything and create a new solid. Make it composition size and apply trap code horizon. There we go. And maybe for the start, I should actually switch off our 3D layers 
the axis ones which take forever to render and this way we'll be able to review much faster what's going on with our motion and animation all right so let's set up the colors for horizon i'm going to work with points mode and use let's say four different colors now because we'll have a pretty bright content on top of it we want to go with very very dark colors and i'm just going to follow the original composition that I made and use shades of violet so let's set this to almost black and play with it a little bit until it comes into the screen for the white color we already have it visible let's see if we can move it somewhere this could be a good spot let's sample that other color and go with something a bit more grayish perhaps we don't really want the background to be very exciting because we'll add shine on top of the whole thing so that would be just distracting uh where is my red color now let's set it to white so it shows up better i see it traveling somewhere around Ha! Huh, okay it was on the completely opposite side of the composition let's move it okay we just need to play with those values and we'll see all of them okay that should do it maybe a bit more to the left and again let's choose some ugly dirty color and the final value is going to move it to where the previous one was that's going to be much faster with locating it offset it a bit to the left and change the color Maybe to the same one as the original. Now it's probably still too bright, but uh, let's preview it. When we move around, we can see the dots quite visibly. So I'm going to increase the point spread until they kind of all merge into each other. And right now we're seeing a lot of banding in here on the monitor, but that's because we're still working in a 8-bit color space. For the final render, I'm going to switch it to 16 or maybe even to 32. All right, let's... Uh, Unshy our layers and bring our background underneath everything and see how the whole thing holds together. Let's make them visible. And this is looking fairly good. I think it's still a bit too bright. So to remedy it, I'm just going to create a black solid or nearly black solid on top of my horizon. Set it to multiply and then play with the opacity until I get the desired result and around 50 seems to be doing fine yep okay now for the shine surprisingly enough the effect that's going to really sell this composition is probably the easiest to set up but before we apply it let's just go to full resolution and also switch our rendering mode from 8 bits per channel all the way to 32 bits per channel and that's because the glow plugin which we'll use reacts quite differently depending on the bit depth of the composition so let's create a new adjustment layer i think we're out of the composition new adjustment layer rename it into glow and apply the glow plugin and right off the bat it's <laughs> looks pretty weird so let's set it up uh glow threshold should be at 95 percent so only really the brightest elements will generate it glow radius we can bump it all the way to 40 and glow intensity could be a bit higher at 1.5 and that creates a pretty nice effect now i still feel like the whole thing is a little bit bland so let's add one more adjustment layer layer new adjustment layer rename it into color correction and apply levels to it so effect color correction levels and i'm just going to crush it a little bit and make sure that our contrast is a little bit sharper that is gonna give much nicer darkness to the background much sharper lines maybe i exaggerated a little bit in here let's make it not quite so strong that should be about it 
There are no real values that I can give you for this one, so you'll just need to eyeball it. And that's it, we're done. This is the way our composition looks. Let's have a look in a few different places. Yes, it is taking a while to render. Yes, so this is really nice. In the very beginning, when we're just introducing everything, we have just a little bit of glow. And then as we go forward, it really starts to shine strong. So let's do some final tweaks. Get inside the axis, 0, 1. Enable motion blur, yes, it's rendering already extremely slow. This is going to be pretty much a killer. We don't need to set any motion blur inside of the modules because there are no moving elements in there, except for the revealing stripes which are already feathered. Let's see if we have anything in this composition that needs to have motion blur enabled. Not really, we could enable the blur on horizon, but since everything is very blurry in the background, it doesn't really matter. So now it's time to gear yourself with a lot of patience and hit render. So here we are. The render is ready. The preview took approximately uh, one to forever to render. So I aborted it and rendered a 32-bit floating point TIFF sequence instead. I can now use it to show you the final result as well as encode it into the preview for this tutorial. Thinking back, it could have been a better idea to render just the 3D data on black background as a TIFF sequence and then use that image sequence for compositing the glows and colors. But regardless, it's looking quite beautiful and I hope yours turned out as well as mine did. For Kuba HQ, I'm Kuba Michalski and I'll see you next time.